Many Christians today have this view of the future that we, the church, are on the losing side. That we are just watching the world fall into chaos while we hold out for Jesus' return. For others, there's this confusion about what we're doing here. Are we living in exile or wandering the wilderness? Or even a sense that we just can't wait to get out of here and go to heaven where we really belong. But what many don't realise is that there is biblical ground for hope. Not just an abstract hope, or only a hope for our souls, but hope for the world that God has made. Hope that is thoroughly based in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Throughout the history of the church, it has been well noted that, whilst theology is a broad topic with so many different avenues to explore, all the specific topics within it are interconnected and feed into each other because ultimately, even though they focus on a different area, they seek to reveal and explain the same God. So there should always be consistency between the different categories. Things like salvation is linked with our view of creation which then links to our understanding of mission and so on. But there is one area that often gets treated as though it falls into its own borders, as if it shouldn't be interpreted through these other areas as well, as if the Bible reserves one place at the back to talk about the topic of eschatology. Eschatology is the study of last things. Often this is thought to just be talking about the end of the world, or the second coming of Christ. But actually, eschatology focuses on the whole period between Jesus' first and second coming. You'll notice, for instance, how the biblical authors refer to anything after Jesus as happening in the last days. And there are three primary views on what the Bible teaches about the end times. Each of them take their name from a passage in Revelation 20, where it says that Jesus will reign for a thousand years. Or to put it another way, he will reign for a millennium. The first view, premillennialism, calls the period we live in now the church age. And one day at the end, Jesus will come back. He will then reign on this earth for a literal thousand years. At the end of the millennium, there will be judgment day. And so, it's called premillennialism because Jesus comes back before the millennium. The second view is known as amillennialism, and it takes a very different perspective. It holds that the thousand years from Revelation 20 are a symbolic number to describe the church age. So we are currently living in the millennium. Because when Jesus ascended, that's when his reign started so he will return after the millennium. The last view is known as post-millennialism. Now it's important to note, this view agrees with the amillennial view that the thousand years are a symbolic number, and we are currently living under Christ's reign. But here's the difference. Unlike in amillennialism, the post-mill view sees Christ's kingdom as growing on the earth until he returns so that one day Jesus' rule will be universally acknowledged and loved on the earth. So it has a very optimistic view of what we will see in the world before Jesus returns. Now for many people, this will sound very different to what they normally hear about the end times. We hear phrases like, the end is near, coupled with doom and gloom. So for many people, this sounds like unrealistic idealism. Often people argue that there is nothing in Revelation 20 to suggest any cause for optimism. But something major that differentiates the post-mill position from the others is that, even though it takes its name from the millennium, it is largely unconcerned with Revelation 20. Instead, it focuses on what Jesus, the apostles and the Old Testament prophets teach about the kingdom and what it will be like when the king reigns. 
So what does the Bible teach about the king and his reign? Well, one place that the authors of the New Testament particularly gravitated towards to explain it was Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is the most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament because it gives such a strong picture of Christ and his reign. And the apostles understood it to be about Jesus' ascension and what that now means for us. The first verse starts with a strong picture of Christ being seated in authority at the Father's right hand. And he's given power to rule and defeat his enemies. In the second verse, there's this emphatic declaration that Christ doesn't wait for his enemies to be defeated before he rules, rather, he will crush his enemies whilst he rules. It speaks to the reality throughout scripture uh, that there is this uh, idea of the enemy being crushed. You see back in, in Genesis 3, uh, in which God gives the promise that the, the serpent's head is going to be crushed. And throughout scripture, we see this in Psalm 110, it's a reiteration of that, more specifically that Jesus is gonna crush the serpent's head. So we might understand that Jesus will one day have all of his enemies defeated. But when we look at this Psalm, there's something important to note. The Psalm doesn't just say, sit at my right hand and one day your enemies will be your footstool. Rather, there's an emphasis on the until. And when we get to the New Testament, in places like 1 Corinthians 15, Paul quotes this Psalm and he really believes what it says, that he must reign until they're all defeated, as they are being now. And what's really interesting is that when Paul says this, he has just said that the end will come after Jesus has defeated all authorities, rulers and dominions. So it's really clear why this psalm shapes the way we view the king and the kingdom, and ultimately how we view our eschatology. Because it is emphatic that as he reigns, he's not doing nothing. He is growing and extending his kingdom, and his enemies will not prevail. And this actually has really big implications on our mission and how we expect it to go. When Peter preaches Psalm 110 in Acts 2, he understands that if Jesus hadn't ascended, if he wasn't currently reigning, and if he wasn't defeating his enemies, then the Holy Spirit would not be poured out and evangelism would fail. And this link with Jesus reigning and evangelism is actually really important to understanding the Great Commission. Jesus doesn't just give the command to go into the world and make disciples of all nations. If you look at what Jesus actually says, it's, all authority in heaven and on earth is mine. He then says, therefore go. In other words, because all authority in heaven and on earth is his, that is our reason for going into the world and making disciples of all nations. The call to mission isn't let's go and lose this one for Jesus, but rather it is let's go into this world because Jesus has already won. So having taken a brief look at how the Bible views Christ as king, it's also important to see how the kingdom itself is described throughout the Bible in both the Old and New Testaments. In Matthew 13, Jesus teaches that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, that though it starts off tiny, it grows into an enormous tree. Daniel sees the kingdom as a rock cut by no human hand that grows into a mountain and eventually fills the whole earth, crushing every other kingdom and rule. Again, Jesus likens the kingdom to leaven that slowly is worked through a loaf of bread so that eventually the whole loaf becomes leavened. Finally, a prophecy found in both Isaiah 2 and Micah 4 is that in the last days the mountain of the house of the Lord will grow to be the tallest mountain and all the nations will flow to it and the peoples of the earth will delight in God's law whilst he establishes peace on the earth. So what we see in these pictures is that the kingdom grows progressively not like a floodgate that all comes in once Jesus returns, but like a drip feed. 
the kingdom is currently growing over all creation, not just in souls being saved. Bear this in mind, just as when sin entered, it didn't just affect the souls of humanity, but also brought a curse on creation. In the same way, Christ's work of redemption goes beyond personal salvation, but undoes the whole curse. And just as we are being sanctified progressively, so is creation as the kingdom grows and extends. But another really important point that these symbols make is that the kingdom grows by the power of God, not by human exertion. So we shouldn't think that we get on with establishing the kingdom in our own strength. Rather, we should be faithfully preaching the gospel and living in the expectation of its victory. Theology should affect us. It should change our emphases and the way we live. And this is just as true with eschatology. This isn't an abstract topic, but it has real implications on the way we live. Christ's ongoing work of redemption gives us hope for the world we live in. Even when this seems hard to see around us, nonetheless, the church should never be so fickle as to trust a newspaper over the promises of God that we find in his word. Instead, let's live our lives in such a way that in our discipleship, our evangelism and our mission, we reflect that we know our king is reigning and he is building his kingdom.